So some pretty good talk so far, huh? Um, it's going to be a tough act to follow. but um, So I thought I'd do something really revolutionary here. I'm actually going to talk about using Elixir and Erlang for a telephony application. Uh, it's pretty funny because uh, you, know, you go to these, these talks, and the odd time you'll see a uh, uh, well, if I'm not talking anyways, uh, some about telephony, but um, I'm going to actually talk through a, uh, a phone server or a soft phone server, uh, give you a demonstration. Um, I'm gonna, first of all, I'll talk about myself because you have to talk about yourself. Um, how we use Elixir at work, uh, I'm going to demo the product and I'll go through a, a, an overview of it, talk a little bit about the architecture, the design, and then some questions at the end if we have time. So who am I? Get my old age goggles on here. Okay, so some information there. We already talked about uh, Canada. Um, a crap load of experience writing software uh, and in the telephony uh, um, area. Um, I'm a partner and the R&D lead at a startup company called eMetrotel. We've been uh, around for about five years or six years, uh, and we provide cost-effective communications. Um, we're a bunch of Vex Nortel people, and so we build systems that uh, help uh, Nortel, people with Nortel equipment um, maintain their equipment and give them a cost-effective upgrade to unified communications. So how do we do, uh, how do we use Elixir? So um, I'm proud to say that I, we've been developing Elixir uh, applications for over two years now. Uh, I think I started at uh, Elixir 0.7 something. Uh, my first application was actually had no Phoenix. It was just real telecom stuff. Um, I presented, uh, presented this at ElixirConf uh, uh, 2014. So if you want to know any information about this, you can look up that video. Um, but it was a, a telephone gateway. It was written in Elixir. Um, and it's, uh, we sell it. Uh, multiple commercial deployments. We're out selling it now and supporting it. Um, wrote a, uh, a notifier application. Uh, this was an interesting project. Uh, I had originally written it uh, with Rails um, using a product called Adhesion for talking to uh, the call server. I'll apologize right now if I use too much uh, te uh, telephony lingo and stop me if you need clarification. Um, so some called Adhesion to talk to the, talk to the telephone switch and uh, get in there and play, play uh, recordings and, uh, and get uh, key presses back. Um, and uh, I could never get the thing. It was, it's very concurrent. So the application is, uh, you, you know, you load up a list of, uh, list of people. Um, it was a hospital application, so all hands on deck, uh, code orange. Um, call everyone into work. So basically you hit a button, it goes through about 300 people. In one deployment, they have about 300 people on staff. It goes through, um, calls everyone about, I think they have configured for 15 calls at a time. Um, they answer, plays a recording saying you need it at work, press one to accept, two to decline, and there's uh, real-time reporting and all that fun stuff. And I could never get it work. All the con concurrency, I couldn't get it working well. So um, one day I said, screw it, and I rewrote it in Phoenix, um, and uh, it worked like a charm. Now, it was not an easy job because I used a bunch of stuff that um, the Elixir Phoenix community uh, ecosystem didn't have. Um, so I had written it with active admin, so I actually wrote uh, X admin to replace active admin, um, and a lot of the interfacing with the telephone switch wasn't there, so I had to write some libraries for those. Um, but that's now, we're selling that, and we have uh, one production deployment on it. Um, and then, of course, the, the one I'm going to talk about today is the WebRTC soft phone. 
Um, and it's uh, currently in alpha testing. Uh, we're getting ready for beta. Uh, hopefully in about a month we should be ready for beta and, uh, and then hopefully selling uh, sometime before the middle of this year. Um, I've got various other prototype applications. Uh, at ElixirConf uh, last year, um, I did a talk on doing a voice survey application. So you create a survey in a database with questions, and then it, someone calls in and it reads out the questions and, and uh, choices, and then they pick it on their, uh, uh, the, on their telephone, and then you get a summary of that. So, um, And that's up on GitHub. So... Uh, WebRTC, soft phone. So what were the goals? So I was asked to uh, create a new soft phone um, for our telephone platform. Uh, and the requirement was support on multiple desktops, so Linux, uh, or sorry, um, Windows and Mac, of course, because I run Mac. And um, also on mobile platforms. Um, we're a startup, so we have very low R&D budget, so... Uh, and one of the requirements, so, so we have, uh, our telephone system has, uh, has, has phones, uh, actually they're um, the old Nortel IP phones, and they're very feature rich, uh, much more feature rich than uh, SIP clients, if you're familiar with the SIP protocol. Um, so we wanted to use that, uh, that protocol for, uh, for signaling and managing the telephone. Uh, it had to uh, be able to interface on the system with all the other phones, as well as be able to talk, uh, phone, phone your mom. So uh, we had to support the PSDN trunks, which is a fancy name for uh, calling everyone else outside the office. Um, PBX, standing for Private Branch Exchange, uh, uh, features like call logging, conference, hot desking, and directed pickup, and there's hundreds of different features. And we also want it to be a future proof for a platform for video, uh, messaging, chat rooms, presence, etc. So we decided to use WebRTC so that we could build this phone in a browser um, and get away, uh, get away from having to package it for different versions of Windows and Mac and, uh, and then separate native clients for all the different mobile platforms. There's just one or two out there. Um, so we chose WebRTC, and for those who don't know WebRTC, just a real quick overview. So it's a new developing standard for real-time communications um, in the browser without the need for native plugins. Um, or any client software installed. So the draft spec uh, involves support for audio, video, and data. Uh, and it's supported in some of the major browsers like Chrome and Firefox uh, natively. Uh, I think there's also some plugins you can install on Edge and uh, Safari and, and so on. Um, it's really a set of JavaScript APIs for doing audio, video, um, and uh, media setup, it handles the NAT traversal, we heard about that earlier, um, has data channels and security. Uh, it's designed for peer-to-peer -peer communication, so, uh, so uh, the media path is actually from, from browser to browser, it doesn't require a centralized server, but it does not define a signaling protocol to figure out who you can talk to and to figure out where they are so that you can send them a request to set up a, a call. So before I go into the details, actually let's do a little demo here. You want to give me a call? Yeah, I hope it works. Oh, oh look at that. Okay, so I got a call coming in. It's up there, and I can actually click it. And uh, it's on my headset right now, so um, let me just test it here. Hello? No? You can't hear me? Oh, I can hear you now. Okay, well, so now I'll put on speak. Can you say something? All right, cool. So... Uh, so we got a we got a call going there. Um, What's that? Okay, so it works. 
Uh, and then there's all kinds of fancy features on here. I can put the call on hold. Whoops, that's, you know, that's the hold button. So there we go. It's on hold now, so you shouldn't be able to hear me. Yeah, 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 it's connected. So, by the way, this is connected. I've got our product, our telephone system, running in a, a virtual machine. So, um, contrary to popular belief, virtual machines aren't all bad. So, um, our product runs on Linux, so I've got it running on a virtual machine here. Um, but, uh, you know, it has a bunch of fancy features like, uh, you know, different lines. So, I can actually, I can go uh, take that off. I got a problem with my dial tone right now. So any, any experts with web audio um, in the audience in JavaScript, I'd love to talk to you. So I can't get my oscillators oscillating. I get that problem all the time. Um, you know, we've got a fancy directory feature in here. So uh, basically it goes into, the, goes into the switch and pulls out all the extensions and, uh, you know, favorites, uh, uh, favorites. So you can add and subtract them from favorites. Um, and uh, lots of fun stuff. So I'll hang up the call. You know, we can go to my voicemail. Password. You have one new message. Press one for new messages. Press two to change. And uh, so anyways, that's, that's what we're building. Uh, if, if you're familiar with Nortel office phones, you'll actually probably recognize this layout. It's very similar to our, to our hard phones. All right. So let's talk about the, extra, uh, the uh, architecture now that you understand what I built. So uh, we have some hard phones. And uh, well, I don't like there's no mouse. Um, and it's connected to the uh, to our call server, which is basically a Linux box. Um, and then up on the top on the, the client side, okay, so we have uh, in the client, I've got, I uh, use jQuery mobile for the, uh, for um, just a general way of rendering the client, and that way it's, uh, it's mobile ready. Uh, it's essentially a single page application. Um, it has selectable UI themes. Um, and um, it's, uh, the UI is mostly driven by WebSockets, um, hence Phoenix. So on the Phoenix side, uh, heavy on the channel, uh, and then a standard architecture, controllers, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I also use xAdmin to, uh, as an admin interface for it. And then on the kind of the pure Elixir side, um, so I've got, uh, you know, probably the main component is, is this client state machine, client SM. It's a Gen, S, a Gen FSM. Um, I've got uh, this proxy that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and then I have some, uh, some modules for the telephony signaling. Uh, we actually talk to the, the switch through a reliable RUDP connection, um, software that I actually, uh, that, that was written as part of a previous project. Um, and then uh, a couple state management uh, apps, uh, supervisors, and uh, that's about it. And then finally, configuration and packaging. So we use uh, RPM to pack it, package it up uh, and deliver it. Um, as part of inside RPM, we use the, uh, XRM and Conform. So go through a little bit of the design details. Um, client controller is pretty simple. It's basically got, in essence, one main action to load the phone. Uh, do authentication uh, uh, through a plug in, uh, in the router. Um, I actually use plug off and I've modified it. I've added uh, uh, a database type uh, um, authentication mode to it. Um, and so when we come in for a request, uh, we check to see if the client uh, state machine is running for that, uh, that session, obviously if we have the session. Uh, and um, if it's not, then we set up the session. Uh, we store, I store the MAC address. Uh, each phone has a MAC of kind of a virtual MAC address. That's how the, how the telephone server identifies it. So store that in the session, load up the, uh, the models. Um, and there's a, a several different models for, for settings, uh, themes, number of keys, 
Uh, the selected audio devices, uh, I was using a headset there, so you, can, you have a separate device for, uh, for a headset and, uh, and the main uh, hands-free option and render the page. The client SM, so uh, have one Gen FSM, that's hard to say, uh, process per uh, every registered client. Um, it handles uh, the client signaling, so it handles the signaling to and from the Asterix uh, switch call server. So our product is based on the open source uh, telephone server called Asterix. Um, and we do that through reliable UDP uh, and uh, stimulus-based uh, signaling stack. And uh, we also handle the signaling to and from the browser through Phoenix channels. Um, one of the things I, one of the problems I had to solve is um, since a lot of the state is done through channels, and there's there's uh, um, and if you hit the reload brow, uh, reload button on the browser, you basically reload everything, but you don't have all the state, all the different messages. So uh, the the icons against the keys, the display, and so on. Uh, so I built a proxy module. So when I uh, when I get a message in or a data in from the switch. I actually go through this proxy, proxy module that basically saves it, and then if you do a refresh in the browser after you've logged in, then it basically just resends out all the, the, the messages, so. Um, pretty extensive watchdog handling, so I've got to handle a case of, um, did uh, this server go away? Or did the call server go away? So there's a bunch of a uh, bunch of watchdogging in there, and um, uh, so the client will detect you know all those different scenarios, go into a state where it renders server unavailable in the display, and then if they come back online, it starts up again. Um, the state machine's fairly large, so this client SM is actually very large. So uh, uh, it's handling the messages from the switch, it's handling the messages from the client, and so on. Uh, so the chance of error in, in that state machine is fairly high. Uh, to protect against that, I actually have a separate process that I store a copy of the, the state um, after each, uh, each uh, event coming in. So, you know, if you're familiar with GenFSM, there's a tuple you, uh, you put at the end for next state and blah, blah, blah. So I actually created a function that, uh, that I call, and in that function, it basically sends the state over to another very simple um, agent to store that state, and so then if the client uh, if the client SM crashes as part of the and the supervisor restarts it, then I just go I detect that and I go out and I get the old state, so it comes back in the exact same state it was. I read about that in a book a whole I think really early on, and it was about a year and a half later, and I thought, oh, I think I've read how to do that. So the client channel, um, it's fairly simple. Uh, basically, you know, message comes in. So on the on the uh, uh, receive side from from the client down, uh, message comes in. There's MAC address in the in the message, so I extract that out. Um, I check to see if the if the state machine is running. Um, if it's not, uh, I send a reload message to the client. Um, if the state machine is running, I tell the, the uh, uh, state machine to update. Oh, sorry, I'm on on join. I got uh, I lost myself. So if I get an on join, which means you've hit the reload button. So um, on the first one, if state machine's not running, I I, uh, um, I send it to wait and uh, or I tell it to uh, to do an update. Uh, handle in is just a bunch of a uh, bunch of clauses to handle the incoming messages. Um, So a couple interesting things in the project. Uh, I have, uh, so the administration interface uh, is, uh, I put it on a separate port. I didn't want, since, you know, this, uh, uh, and everyone in the office is using that, right? Uh, whereas the admin interface is just a, an in, admin person. So I didn't want to put it on the same port. So I actually have two separate ports and so two separate endpoints to manage that. 
Um, furthermore, the authentication for the admin interface is different. It uses a database table as part of our telephone system and not my application. Um, so, uh, so I have a, a different authentication plugin for that or a different configuration for that. And uh, I also have multiple repos, like I just said, there's a separate database for, um, for, for two areas, the admin login as well as that directory feature I showed you. Um, it's actually using a, a, a different database. Um, they're both MySQL, uh, so I have uh, an endpoint for either. So. Some of the uh, production implications of building a, a product for production. Um, uh, one thing we like to do when we want to make money is protect our intellectual property. Uh, so I, um, all my projects have this uh, remove debug info. Uh, and I just gave a little, little example in the pinup here. So a uh, couple lines in your, uh, in your mix file uh, enables that. Plus I had to put a little bit of code in my presentation. So. Uh, so packaging, use the XRM to, uh, to build the uh, release tar file. Um, like I said, we use RPM, so as part of the build, uh, the build part in a, an RPM spec file, um, I actually run the mixed, uh, mix uh, depths get and then the release and so on in the build section. Um, and uh, configuration, we're using conform. Um, pretty standard stuff, uh, except we use a different uh, non-standard uh, config file location. Um, I also use syslog, so all the logging goes to syslog, and I use a uh, syslog package that I wrote a while ago that's uh, in uh, GitHub. So what's happening in the browser? Um, most of it, so the, the HTML is pretty basic. It's just a big file that you know, uh, renders all those controls. Um, but all the logic is, handling, uh, is handled through the channel. So I've got like uh, 50 or so channel on handlers uh, for all the different things that come in. So update the display, uh, update the button text, uh, icons, um, you know, the keys are context sensitive. Uh, setting up media path, playing dial tone, um, DTMF tones, uh, starting and stopping the ringer, uh, switching mic and speakers, etc. Uh, a lot less channel pushes, so a lot less uh, traffic going out, uh, going from the from the browser down to the server. Said so it's a single page application, uh, so all all the pages are loaded loaded in one action. Uh, using jQuery mo uh, mobile page transitions, Ajax requests. So if I go and in, go into the settings and do a um, submit, it does an Ajax request and uh, comes back. Most of them are like that. There's a couple actions that uh, require a page reload, like changing the theme. Um, so some of that forces a page reload, which is problematic with WebRTC because it doesn't like uh, a reload of the page when, you're, when you have a media path connected. So I would actually put some uh, JavaScript code in there to stop or block uh, page reloads when you're on a call. And then I have separate controllers uh, for the different uh, the settings and the properties and et cetera. So design a WebRTC. Um, so WebRTC, most of the work's done in, in uh, just a few JavaScript APIs. Um, there's a concept of a, a peer, and um, uh, there's a, for every call, uh, there's a NAT traversal um, protocol called ICE. I actually saw it on a previous presentation. Um, so a couple calls like that. Um, uh, Phoenix channels are perfect for this. So um, you know, getting getting a request in and passing the passing the signaling information, uh, something called an SDP packet. Uh, you know, Phoenix works great for that. Um, the media path is done outside uh, Elixir and Phoenix, so the media path is uh, is from the browser. In this case, we're not doing peer to peer, so we actually connect the soft phone to our switch, and then our switch switches out to some other phone. So. Um, so we uh, actually had to build some uh, some WebRTC support into our our, uh, our channel driver for our phones. Um, 
this was, uh, this was interesting. Um, when I first started doing this, I wanted to try to do more work in Elixir. Um, so I went out looking for support for a nice client for, you know, Phoenix Works. Found pieces of some of this stuff, but not a full production implementation that I could find. Um, also, uh, the media path in uh, WebRTC has to be encrypted with DTLS, just TLS for UDP. And um, there's no support uh, in Erlang, which was a red herring because there's code in there to do it and posts out there to, to, on how to do it, but it doesn't work. And if you read further enough, further enough down the road, down, down the listings, it says, oh, yeah, well, we only did about half the stack. So, um, yeah, that was a day. So we ended up doing the ICE uh, and the DTLS in the Asterix channel driver. Uh, and so I don't, I, um, I basically... Uh, Take the, take the information from WebRTC down through Phoenix. I get the candidates and the, the different information, but then I pass that through our protocol to, to the call server, and uh, it handles the rest of it. Um, believe it or not, the headset support was a nightmare. So, you know, if you ask me, is WebRTC ready? My answer is no. Um, you know, for your basic client-to-client, -client, very simple applications, uh, you know, it, it's great. Um, but just to be able to uh, ha support multiple devices, so a headset and hands-free, and to be able to push a button to switch between them in call, it was a nightmare. I, I've spent, I don't know, I probably spent two weeks on this, and, and, and that's a lot of time. Um, I couldn't find any good examples, so I managed to find about three different technologies and things and mush them together and uh, got it working. So uh, if you're ever trying to do that, uh, let me know. I also have a link here. So uh, I wrote a very primitive peer-to-peer -peer WebRTC example uh, early on in the project just so I could understand how things worked. And I have that up in GitHub. So if you are playing with WebRTC um, yeah, with Phoenix or Elixir, you, know, you can go there. Uh, just another, uh, another little... Um, what I thought was an interesting little uh, challenge or, or thing I, I dealt with was um, our product is licensed commercially, so you actually have to buy it, and, and uh, it's, it's licensed to a server, um, and the licensing is uh, based on the number of clients that you can actually have registered and using it at a time. Um, so... Uh, So basically, uh, you know, I, I have a license manager, and, and I have several uh, Elixir projects, so, so I, share, I share this. Um, or I built it shareable with this project because I, I had copied it over twice uh, for two other projects, and I thought, no, that's not good. Um, so I actually built a, a module for this. I have it built so that in development you can actually uh, mock it out or config it out so that you don't need a license in, in dev. Um, but I built that so that you can't actually configure it out in production mode because we don't want customers doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, to do that because of a separate project, um, you actually, on the, depths, uh, on the depths line, you actually have to pass the environment across, uh, as I'm showing in this example. Okay, what were some of the challenges? Um, Elixir and Phoenix weren't, so they're awesome. Um, I wish I could spend all my time working in, in Elixir and Phoenix on the project, but unfortunately I have to do some JavaScript. Uh, WebRTC, I talked about some of those challenges already. Um, still have a few challenges. I'm finding some echo and voice quality issues I have to resolve. Um, single page web applications can be a little tricky. Um, And uh, migrations, we've got to solve this. So yeah, running migrations uh, for production is, uh, I actually ended up having to write some of my own code there. So 
I made the mistake of running running uh, echo migrate in the build section of my spec file, only to realize that that's run on the on the build uh, the host and not the target. So, anyways, I did solve that and uh, have a solution for that for uh, for just calling the um, calling the migrate uh, function in echo directly uh, through an RPC call after um, uh, after the uh, project is up or the, the application is up during the install. Questions? So the questions, uh, the question is, have I run into any IVR call trees stuff in all of this? Um, the, so a couple of the applications I've built are based on that. So the call out application has a very simple one, press one to accept, two to decline. So that's that's a you know a binary choice in an IVR. Um, the uh, the voice the voice survey application is kind of an IVR application, right? Because when you call in, it's actually going to go through the database, read the question, read all the choices, and then you get to pick. And then it has you know it has options to replay and uh, and all that stuff. So that is kind of an IVR. So. Um, Part of that, I wrote a couple libraries um, for at, for the Asterix call server so that I can interface from Phoenix uh, or from uh, Elixir to the Asterix call server. And so what happens is, uh, you know, when they come in, that, that call is, you know, that stuff is directed into my Elixir application, and I'm able to play out recordings and ask choices and, and, uh, and stuff. So, so that's your question? Cool because when you call it. All right. Thanks very much.